They took Kabul without a fight. Now comes the hard part as Afghanistan stares at a cash crunch coupled with a food crisis. The UN warns half the country's population is at risk. And after what critics call empty promises by the Taliban to keep women in school and in the workforce, no foreign power is yet to recognize the country's new leadership. That's the picture as we chalk up the present and the no-shows at a virtual summit of G20 nations hosted by Italy this Tuesday. We'll ask if that's arguably the second most important meeting on Afghanistan today. What with U.S. and EU leaders sitting down in Qatar with the Taliban foreign minister. And whether you're in Doha or in Rome, the burning question's the same. Under what terms does the outside world normalize ties with the Taliban? Today in the France 24 debate, how the West deals with the new rulers of Kabul. Joining us, journalist Mortaza Beboudi, who is just back this very morning from Afghanistan. Thanks for dropping in. Thank you. We'll be uh, hearing more about that shortly. Uh, diplomat uh, Jean-Yves Berthaud, former French envoy to Kabul, author of Lunch with the Taliban. Thanks for being with us. Uh, with us as well, she's written several books on Afghanistan, former member of the European Parliament, Patricia Lalonde, vice president of the Geopragma think tank. Nice to see you. The uh, France 24 debate where you can join the conversation and you have on Facebook and Twitter, hashtag F24 debate. Yeah, 1 billion euros pledged by the European Union. Where does the money go? Andrew Hillier has that story. More than two months after sweeping to power in Afghanistan, the Taliban are on a diplomatic offensive. Intent on making their case for international recognition, they sat down with US and EU officials in Doha. The group are desperate for foreign help to stop the country slide into economic misery. EU and US officials have ruled out recognizing the government in Kabul for now, a state of affairs that the Taliban argue could worsen the plight of the Afghan people. That, in itself, the central topic at a special summit of the G20 in Rome. Speaking at the summit, Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi underlined the need to act before it's too late. The emergency humanitarian that is developing in Afghanistan is grave. And they have also noted how, with the closeness of the winter, the situation is precipitating. But Western leaders face a delicate balancing act, how to get aid to the Afghan people without endorsing Taliban rule. Ahead of the summit, EU leaders agreed to unlock 1 billion euros of humanitarian aid. The bloc insisted the money would go directly to aid agencies working on the ground and not to Taliban officials in Kabul. Not to Taliban officials in Kabul, Murtaza Bebudi, um I mean, Afghanistan's been notorious over the past 20 years for squandered aid, but is it possible to help the people without the money getting into the pockets of, uh, of, the, uh, of those uh, who are being accused of violating human rights? Yeah, actually, um, in Afghanistan, it's more than a, a catastrophic humanitarian crisis. People are starving. No one is ready to recognize Taliban right now. I mean, giving the money to who? To Taliban? No. It is not possible. We don't know what is happening. We see people in Afghanistan that their families, they are obliged to sell baby to, in order to save the, the, the firstborn child. For example, the people are starving, displaced people. But right now, um, what, what is this possible is that the United Nations intervene in Afghanistan that has two NGOs, local NGOs, to go into to the field. They are still working, the education. It's been more about a month that the girls up to 12 years old cannot go to school. So it is possible to funnel the money directly to those aid agencies? Well, we can talk to Taliban, uh, but uh, we have to put conditions. Giving money to Taliban is not possible, of course. Uh, we need the intervention of the United Nations in order to give food, to distribute food to the, uh, the displaced people. More than 2 million people are displaced now, uh, starving, uh, sleeping on the streets in Kabul and other provinces, for example. We met a family in uh, Kandahar. They are still on the streets, and the 
UN are giving uh, money, of course, I mean, this, uh, with the humanitarian uh, aid coming from the border and from Pakistan, but it's not enough right now. The people are still living in districts and villages. They don't receive these helps. And they still people are growing uh, opium, and we see that the opium trade. People think if the Taliban, they are saying that we don't, uh, uh, we don't want to, uh, w that people, the agriculture, they don't plant opium, but they are saying if they don't, we don't receive uh, uh, help, we, we continue. Patricia Lalonde, if I'm to be crassly um, tr transactional, shall we say, uh, uh, about it, when the EU pledges a billion euros, it's not charity. It's because they don't want a refugee crisis on their border. Of course. Uh, I hope this is not a cover-up for a failure. I, of course, it is very important to give uh, money for humanitarian, uh, this humanitarian, humanitarian crisis. It's terrible. But um, I think very quickly the Euro European Union wants to give one billion Euro, it's, uh, it seems to me that we have to do it, but we have to be very careful that this uh, money doesn't go in the pocket of the Taliban. So we, uh, I agree with, um, with you on this, on this issue. And you have to be very careful that the NGOs uh, could uh, work uh, by themselves and not uh, on the direction of the, of, the, of the Taliban. And secondly, I hope that this first step for the European Union. Union. I heard um, Joseph Borrell uh, on the issue. Foreign policy yes, chief. yes, uh, foreign policy chief. He said very clearly it's not uh, the first first step to recognize the Taliban. But I hope so. I hope it is not uh, a way to uh, to um, further recognize the Taliban. It's interesting. It's coincidence of the calendar. Italy happens to hold the rotating presidency of the the G20. That's why the meeting was in Rome, uh, but Italy's worked hard on this topic and they have a track record on when it comes to Afghanistan. Yes, indeed. Um, the Italians uh, made their best at the time when the Taliban were in power between 96 and 2001, and they helped for a political solution as a political alternative to be set up to the Taliban. And uh, in fact, I was coordinating with the Italian ambassador at the time in, uh, in Islamabad because they didn't have an embassy in Kabul at the time when I did have my talks in Kabul with the Taliban. And we managed you know, to launch the initiative with uh, the former king of, uh, of, Afghanistan, uh, of Afghanistan, King Zahir. So with, you, you uh, hear both Mortaza and Patricia saying yeah. that helping out the Afghans has to come via the UN. How, how feasible does it seem to you under the current well, circumstances? It is, Can you bypass it is the, very, it the government? Is, it is very feasible because anyhow, uh, the arm of the UN always have been the NGOs. You know? I mean, this is a world that is very closely connected. And once upon a time, when the Taliban were already in power, uh, that's the way it was handled. The money was not going to the Taliban pockets. It was uh, uh, decided for Afghanistan and then distributed. So, uh, like, for instance, raw materials were being bought and then distributed, I mean, sacks of rice or whatsoever, you know, were distributed to the NGOs who were uh, then uh, conveying the, um, the aid effort to the, family, the needed uh, families. And which of the two meetings is the most important one this Tuesday, the one in Rome or the one in Doha? Because, yes, there have been meetings, uh, in plenty of meetings between U.S. and Taliban officials. But this time you have had in front of the cameras U.S. and EU in the same room with the Taliban. Yes, indeed. Uh, well, these efforts are complementary. It is important, indeed, that the international community is consenting uh, a, a humanitarian effort for the population because the risk of starvation has never been bigger since many decades, since maybe 1972, uh, because of the drought that has affected Afghanistan this year and last year as well, so that uh, crops have not been uh, gathered, and also because of the disastrous handling by the Taliban, uh, the, their disastrous ruling. I mean, uh, everybody was taken by surprise when they arrived, but those who were even most taken by surprise were the Taliban themselves. They were not expecting such a quick victory, and they were not ready. 
at the same time, a number of the people who could handle, uh, uh, help rule the country technically, civil servants, engineers and people, these people either have gone or they are going out of the country. So we are in a disastrous situation at the moment. I'm Mortaza Bebudi, you've made several trips since August 15th when, uh, when the Taliban took uh, Kabul. Do you get the sense when you're in the capital that we're still in that holding pattern that we were in two months ago of they haven't quite decided who's going to be in charge, they, they haven't got their ducks in order? Actually, um, there is no, I mean, when we see the Taliban government right now in Kabul and uh, the Kabul administration of Taliban, um, we, uh, I, they, they, it seems that they are playing with countries, actually. They are playing with the, with the Europeans, other countries. Okay, we do. Uh, w what they say, they don't do that, what they say. For example, they are, they are now ban they banned a woman to protest. They banned journalists to cover the protest right now in Kabul. We couldn't uh, uh, cover the protest right now in Kabul uh, since uh, last week, uh, the, the, the week before, for example. Mm. The uh, problem that the girls cannot go to school, for example. But there, this, the, the Taliban, the Taliban will not have inclusive government, what they say. So Will not have inclusive government, but do you agree with Jean-Yves Berthaud that they've been sort of caught by surprise? and how easy it's been uh, walking into Kabul. Yeah, I mean, they were surprised also. We talked to Taliban, they were surprised. Oh, we didn't know that the, hmm. it's, it's so easy that to take Kabul. But in the same time, uh, when we sit there, they, they don't have the idea how to govern, how to lead this country. They don't have this idea. Patricia Lalonde, 2021 is not 1994. And we, with those images, your thoughts when you see the images in Doha of the of the meeting taking place. You wouldn't have seen that back in the 1990s, right? No, yes, of course. But uh, I, I fear that the Taliban, uh, from the first act in uh, 1907, is now the same than, than now. They are the same Taliban. Of course, they are stronger, they are powerful, they are, they are moder modernist. But uh, they, are the, they have the same ideology and they are going to do when the you, same with the population, with the women, with the girls, uh, for, for, to forbid the uh, girls, women to go to school. And uh, for the civil society, it is uh, terrible. And I personally, I, I know very well Afghanistan, not much like ambassador, but uh, uh, I can tell you that uh, I am very afraid. I, I, I don't trust at all this sort uh, of... You don't uh, trust the Taliban. Yes, no, of course. But, not you, at heard, all. but you heard Jean-Yves Berthaud mention there is mm. this drought, there's the fact that there's a brain drain. You have to engage with the leadership in Kabul, yeah. right? Yes, it was the... So how do, you, how do you do it? How do you go about... How do you... Under what... How do you have a conversation with the Taliban in these circumstances? It was the same, exactly the same thing in 1970. Uh, it was the same, but... In the 1990s? Yes, it was exactly the same, uh, the, the same way. But uh, now we have to... Um, I hope, I, I think, I fear that the Taliban are going to give guarantees to the international community all the countries about women, girl, uh, girls going to school, women rights, uh, uh, go inclusive government. But by the time being, since, since the time they have taken the power, uh, one one month and a half, uh, there is not an inclusive government because uh, in this government there is uh, no minorities, no women, uh, and it is completely uh, clerical government, and with uh, people from the Akani clan who is. Uh, with uh, inside this government, and I think it's a it's very, very dangerous uh, situation for the for the time being. But I can understand the international community because uh, they are saying, uh, wh "What can we do now? <laughs> we are not going to to go to war again on, uh, in Afghanistan." That's why there is a resistance going uh, strongly. Mm -hmm. we'll, we'll talk we'll talk about that in a moment. Jean-Yves Berthaud, uh, in your book, and in fact, you you gave it the title of your book. The there's this incredible scene. You invite, after m much jostling and negotiation, you manage to invite the top leadership of the Taliban to sit down for lunch at the French embassy. The, the skeleton staff at the embassy has to has to dust off the place. You have to you prepare a meal, and it was people who coming from the countryside who 
many of them who'd never eaten a Western meal before. And so you had to accommodate the menu. You couldn't just serve traditional French. There was no bœuf bourguignon on the menu, I believe. <laughs> <laughs> How do you talk with the Taliban? Well, at the time, the French government thought that it was important to talk with all parties involved in the conflict. We were not in the same situation as we are nowadays in the sense that the Taliban were more or less controlling 90% of the country and the 10 or 15, depending on the periods, remaining percent were, was uh, being uh, um, uh, taken by uh, uh, the Northern Alliance. So, uh, you know, in order to be pragmatic, because we had a number of things to defend at the time, especially regarding our French communities, I mean, the NGO communities, the French traditionally have been uh, very many uh, doing these humanitarian jobs, but the half of the whole Western population were, were French. So that was a very good reason, you know, to talk with the Taliban in order to make sure in case some of our people would have been threatened or in danger for whatsoever reason, um, well, we would have been able, you know, to have the necessary contacts and so on. But this is only one part of it. I mean, uh, I was personally exerting a sort of uh, cultural pressure upon them. I was, you know, talking a lot about the Quran, for instance. Uh, I thought it was more interesting and useful in this particular context to talk about um, a number of uh, precepts of Islam rather than throwing at their face the universal declaration of human rights, which they would not have. Uh, taken into account. And at times I obtained, as I describe indeed, I obtained a, a few uh, concrete uh, uh, outcomes. Like, for instance, I, I managed uh, talking to the Minister of Health at the time uh, of the Taliban to, to, to obtain the, the, the liberation of, uh, of two, uh, no, the, the opening of, uh, of hospitals to women. And that was a great achievement, even if, well, that was a drop in the ocean of that misery. But at the same time, you know, I do believe that, uh, well, we don't need to recognize them, uh, but we, I do tend to think that we need to talk to them. Anyway, the President Macron announced that himself, uh, when was it, on Saturday. Uh, and I, I would really tend to think this is the right uh, way of approaching it, talk with them, not necessarily recognize them, and then try to use whatever leverage we have at our disposal. There is the leverage of finances so that the Taliban are not immediately rejected by some segments of the populations, of the, popul of the Afghan uh, ethnic groups. Because if that happens, we might it might lead to a situation that would be worse than the present one, because uh, some groups are more radical than the Taliban. Mm, I want to pick up on that point. We we'll take a very quick break. Stay with us. You're watching the France 24 debate. Welcome back or welcome if you're just joining us. It's the France 24 debate on a day uh, when uh, the uh, donors have been uh, meeting in, on a G20 summit uh, in a virtual G20 summit, mostly in, in Rome. And U.S. and EU leaders have uh, been uh, speaking with top Taliban representatives, including their foreign minister in, in uh, Qatar. We're talking about it with Mortaza Beboudi, a journalist just back from Afghanistan with partner station France 2. Uh, diplomat Jean-Yves Berthaud, former French envoy to Kabul, author of Lunch with the Taliban, and former member of the European Parliament, Patricia Lalonde, vice president of the Geopragma think tank. Patricia, can we just do one minute here of uh, diplomatic uh, speak here? So, so far, no country rep recognizes the Taliban, even Qatar, even Pakistan, they don't recognize them. What do you think about this virtual G20 summit that took place China's leader didn't uh, take part. He sent uh, someone lower ranking. Russia, which is holding its own humanitarian conference later this month, uh, they didn't have uh, President Putin uh, call in. It was a virtual summit. He could have called in if he wanted to, right? 
Yes, it's a, it's a virtu virtual summit, but um, as you say, there is a Moscow summit uh, ne next week, I think. The and 20th, I believe. Yes, yes 20th of, uh, of uh, October. And uh, they have invited Turkey, different people, Turkey, Pakistan, Iran, uh, of course, and the, India. the Russian, India, India and China. So it seems that this summit will, will be different or is some, some kind of summit we can uh, cancel the other the summit we had with uh, the G20 summit in, uh, in Rome. So uh, I think many things are happening. You know that the, the, the foreign minister, the English foreign minister sent a special envoy in Kabul four days ago. There is now this meeting in, uh, there is a, a meeting of the US in Doha uh, Sunday. Now there is a, the G20 today and tomorrow there is the other one in Moscow. So, so again, it's very well, different from what it was very, like in very the 1990s. Different, different, but for, for the time being, everybody, nobody wants to recognize the Taliban. And I fear non, non the, the Russian, uh, the, the China, okay, but not the, not the Russian for the time being. They don't want to recognize it now because even Qatar has a problem with the Taliban now because the, the new the government there. Now it's impossible to recognize this government because it is a backlash on the old days and uh, it is not possible. When the Taliban <laughs> swept to power, there were accusations that... Uh, Pakistan is pulling the strings. No, uh, Qatar is pulling the strings. What, what, who's, who's in or out with the Taliban right now? I mean, of course, we see that right now in the, in Afghanistan from outside. If you see that the Pakistan Prime Minister saying, "Oh, people, countries have to recognize um, uh, Taliban." Or when we but see Pakistan hasn't done it yet. Yes, but Pakistan inviting the because they don't want to be, take the first step. That's why, and they don't want to be accused again that they are uh, financing Taliban. And they they did also. I mean, they, we, when we see the Chinese, they are in background airbase right now. When we see Qataris, they are do all these humanitarian flights. They are present in Afghanistan. When we see that Iranian, they are in present in Afghanistan. Also, they are selling petrols, so sending. Um, giving money and humanitarian aids to, 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 to Afghanistan. When we see all of this, we see that, okay, I mean, these neighbor countries, they are in, but they don't want to recognize it first. So this is a good news story. You were saying don't isolate them too much or they become more radical. So this is good news, right? Well, yes. Well, indeed, I, I totally agree with what you, you just uh, said, Mr. Mortaza said. Um, Paki the, the role of Pakistan is, has been crucial in the whole affair. Uh, Pakistan, you know, uh, was out of the discussions in Doha. Although uh, Pakistan was hoping that after these 20 years in, in which it had been marginalized, it would go back into the Afghan game for its strategic uh, ambitions. And it could not because the leaders there were precisely people that had been either betrayed or jailed or anyway, uh, people that had to suffer from Pakistan. That is the case of Mullah Baradar, which, who was supposed to be the prime minister. And that was also the case of the Amir al muminin I mean, the, the, the leader of the believers. Uh, so that uh, in reality, what happened is that these people had given assurances that a number of human rights issues would be dealt with in a way that would accommodate the West uh, and the rest of the world. So uh, when you see on that point, for instance, there's one of the, the uh, prominent member of the so-called Haqqani network uh, from neighboring Pakistan who's in the government, what does that tell what, you? What happened is that there was already a sort of a shadow government that had been determined uh, during the Doha discussions with Barada leading the government, with concessions being made, with a better approach of human rights and uh, w women's condition and so on. What happened is that during that sort of phase, in extraordinary phase when the Taliban took over without really being prepared, uh, the people who arrived first, I mean the militants that arrived first, were those from uh, the southeastern provinces, that is the people of the Haqqani clan. And these, uh, this Haqqani clan are much more linked 
to Pakistan than uh, these people of Doha. So you're saying the, the, those EU and US representatives were perhaps talking to the wrong people when they... Well, not, not at all. But they were talking to people and promoting them while they were talking to them, certainly. But the reality is complex because Pakistan is playing his own game. Mm -hmm. And this is the, the core of the problem. And this is one reason why uh, these contacts, I, I, um, very glad to have the opportunity to repeat it. The contacts that the whole world is having at the moment are, are very useful in order to identify who is who and in order not to let Pakistan decide only for the sake of Afghanistan. Because contrary to what, to what a number of people think, you know, they see a lot of people uh, think see the Taliban as a sort of unique ensemble, very homogeneous and monolithic. It's not at all the right. case. And, and you know, uh, in my book, uh, you see that very well, because some are people that I never obtain anything from, and others mm -hmm. are people that you can talk with and even convince mm -hmm. them. So this is, you know, uh, something fundamental in order to approach Afghanistan. Jean-Yves Berthaud talking about the, the, the reality in the south of the country. Mortaza Beboudi got to see it up close. Uh, his team from partner station France 2 went to the southern city of Kandahar, capital of the Taliban heartland. It's a report read by Yinke Oyetade. Out in the streets of Kandahar, it's impossible to find a woman who is not wearing a burqa. To get around, many of them travel in the trunks of cars, while men take their place on seats. There isn't much resistance to the Taliban here. The province is dominated by the Pashtun ethnic group, who are largely supportive of the militants. Of course, we're very happy since the Taliban took over. We feel safer. The Taliban have said restoring security in Afghanistan is their priority. In this prison, the militants have been rounding up drug users, many of them men and teenage boys, who have taken heroin. People who take drugs break everything. They disturb people. That's why we put them in prison. Afghanistan is the world's largest exporter of heroin. Officially, the Taliban have said that they will ban the cultivation of opium, as they did when they were last in power. But in markets across Kandahar, opium is still sold by the kilo on a daily basis. Many of the farmers know the Taliban partly funded its insurgency with the drug trade. A large part of Afghanistan's population depend on opium cultivation. If the Taliban and the international community help us, then we can stop. But if we don't harvest the opium, we don't eat, so we have to continue. At the heart of their policies, this man, the Taliban supreme leader Mullah Akunzada. He's rarely seen in public for security reasons. The Americans are violating our airspace. They fly drones to target our supreme leader. They're a constant threat to him. The supreme leader also gives guidelines for the education system. Since the Taliban took over, the only thing on the curriculum is memorizing the Quran. Afghanistan's new rulers have promised more moderate governance since their last stint in power. But in the Taliban heartland of Kandahar, like much of the rest of the country, some are still fearful for the future. Murtaza Beboudi, interesting. You, you spoke to that one man on the street says, we got to, I have to make money here. I've got to sell my, my opium, right? My poppies, excuse me. Yeah, I mean, they're still there uh, making uh, money out of uh, drugs and opium. Because what's the alternative? And the Taliban, they just they close eyes. What's the alternative? There, there's no help from the government. The, 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 the former government, government didn't help them, and the Taliban protect these uh, farms of uh, opium farms. But now the Taliban, they're closing eyes. They just let them sell and uh, continue again. But right now, I mean, what we have to say, I mean, we tr trusting Taliban. I mean, when, when the, the supreme leader of Taliban, the, he's not showing up, how we can trust to them. He's not, the Taliban, they don't, the Taliban leaders, they don't want to talk to people, even in Kandahar in the south, or even if you see in the capital, other people, the majority, the language, when you see the language, the, the, the national language of Afghanistan, the official is Dari and Pashto, but the majority speak Dari. But the Taliban, they don't speak to people. They say, you have to speak my language, Pashto. Mm -hmm. If you don't speak that, I cannot speak so they're to doing, you. So they're still doing a victory lap of when course, you were there. Yeah. You were there three days ago. Yes, and the European journalists can 
interview Taliban and not Afghan journalists. They cannot talk to them. Patricia, I don't know your, your, your thoughts on this, because it, you know, the, the Americans were there for 20 years. They didn't stop the poppy trade either, did they? Yes, of course, but uh, I am not so uh, pessimistic about what uh, the Americans have done in, 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 uh, in Afghanistan, because there is now a strong civil society. Uh, women's rights are OK, uh, girls are going to school. So we cannot just uh, say uh, Americans were there for 20 years of war. And of course, there is no war for 20 years. There is uh, Taliban attacks. But I can, uh, just one thing I, I want to say, it's about the security. Taliban say, uh, now we are bringing security. We, at that, at the, ta the first act of the Taliban, he used to say uh, security is better than to have civil war. But now there is no security at all. You can see this uh, terrible attack in the mosque in, uh, in Kunduz, in the northern part yeah, of she Afghanistan. Is she has targeted. State. And you know who was um, the guy who conducted the suicide attack? He was a Uyghur. So I think it will not be very easy for the Chinese. For, you can, China. You can, for, for China, you, you, you can understand. So security is a real issue. There is a threat uh, I heard this morning about uh, Kabul, the hotel in Kabul uh, now by ISIS, Daesh, and, and there is a compli very complicated game between ISIS, Daesh, and the Taliban, Pakistani Taliban. And we've already seen, make, uh, Patricia Lalonde, uh, the Taliban getting information from the U.S. when it comes to fighting ISIS. I don't understand your question. <laughs> well, we saw at the outset that the, the, the U.S. Had, had tipped off, that they, they'd said that they tipped off uh, them when it, about the presence of ISIS-K around the airport in Kabul. Yes, right? yes, of course, because uh, when you have ISIS, you can, you can say, oh, OK, Taliban are better, are better than ISIS. So, yeah. But in fact, they are playing a, a, a but Double some, game, yeah, but some of these suicide bombers, they, they were released by Taliban from the yeah, uh, prisons yeah, in Kabul. Right. Mm. And this is what he's saying, that they cannot assure the security in Afghanistan. Mm. And they're still saying, we want to be recognized uh, by the international com community. It is not possible. So Jean-Yves Berthaud, what's the bigger threat for the Taliban? People who are more radical than they are or the infighting that you described earlier? Well, um, the potential for it. Bo bo both are linked, you know, because if the Taliban lose ground politically, that will help some of these uh, extremist groups to um, to emerge. So, um, and this is the reason why uh, the Taliban decided to freeze uh, their whatever initiative that would have been considered by us as a progress in the social front, etc. And this is why, for the time being, they cannot proceed. Uh, at the same time, uh, there is one thing which I believe is quite strong within uh, the governance, so to say, of the Taliban. It's the secret services. Uh, they are very well informed. And, of course, they have been helped by Pakistan in this regard. So regarding last Friday's uh, attack on a Shia mosque in well, Kunduz, what, yeah, well, of course, how did they not I mean, stop it? Is it hard, impossible? They, they have these cells, which are even in Kabul and in a, a few of the major cities, but it's mostly in the province of uh, Nangarar. Uh, that's where they are. And that's about 1,000, maybe 1,200 people around the country, but not more than that. And the Taliban, with the help of some of their allies, uh, that is to say Pakistan mostly, certainly are, do have the capacity uh, to, to deal with it. They have yeah. the capacity, you agree? I mean, when we see that the Taliban, they want to target the Hazara people, the, the, the Shiite man, minority. But when you see that 400 families, they were displaced by force by Taliban from Daikundi province, when we see that the, 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 the families from a district in Mazar Sharif forced by Taliban to leave in a few days, we see they let them if they know. But Mortaza, they know. isn't it in their interest at a time when we've just been describing how desperate they are for, for uh, help from the outside, from the outside community? Isn't it in their interest to show that they've got a handle on security? But I mean, right now, the, the Taliban, they don't care about the, what is happening inside. When they, we see with the poverty, we see with the secu about the security, journals in protest from the uh, girl education, all of the, they just, what they care, uh, they, they need the international recognition.
Right. Yeah, but they will not get it, you know, if they don't make these efforts. So there's a contradiction there. What? No, I, I hmm. think I think personally that they will uh, certainly try to improve when the political ground allows it. All right, let, let, let's take a look at uh, the, the French news agency, AFP, uh, was also uh, in, in Kandahar. And outside of the northern city of Mazari Sharif, secondary schools now off limits to girls in Afghanistan. And uh, even though primary That's schools difficult. remain open, female teachers, like in this school in Kandahar, openly expressing in front of the microphone their frustration. It's been two months and we've not received our salary. Some girls will come up with their school fees by selling things from their home, but those kids don't even have food at home and are facing an extremely difficult situation. Bartaza, listen carefully. Not everybody is sympathetic. Interviewed by AFP, this Kandahar locals clearly had enough of being lectured by the outside world. Uh, the international community should not interfere in our internal matters. Our law is clear. When I listen to the radio, I hear human rights and women, human rights and women. They should not slander the emirate. They should not slander the emirate. Mortaza, when you were in Kandahar, a lot of people think like him? I mean, we see in Kandahar, many people there were happy to, to have the Taliban because 40 years of war attacks suicide bombers. But now they don't have this. I mean, at least it's, it's less. Uh, that's why I'm in Kandahar. People, they are more, uh, more are, uh, are happy to have Taliban on the ground. But in the same time, when we see that this, this uh, Quranic schools are, are all open and the children, they don't go to school anymore right now. They are closed, many schools. When the Minister of Higher Education of Taliban officially announced that the, those Afghans studied years ago, they consider as a lost generation. Mm. Because they didn't study Quran. Mm. Patrice, you. I don't know, what would you answer to the man in, in Kandahar who says, uh, "Stop lecturing you know, me about human rights and women's rights"? I, I can't. I can't believe it. You <laughs> know, I am. I was working in Mazar-e Sharif myself. I have. Uh, I contribute to to build schools there, and I know very well the, the students in Mazar-e Sharif, and it's terrible for me. To and how have they been able to keep the secondary schools so open now, in Mazar-e Sharif, whereas they're closed elsewhere? Why is that? Because in the north, they are well, 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 much more educated. And for the Taliban, it's easier for them to have the, the, the little girl educated in, in the north. You know, at the time, the Taliban were in, in charge in all Afghanistan, the, in the Panjshir Valley. Uh, I used to go there very often. And uh, there, there were go, girls' school every, everywhere. The, the girls are going to school, not only to, not to, uh, to study the Quran only, but... Uh, Jean-Yves Berthaud, how much has Afghanistan changed since the time when you were France's envoy there? Well, in cities, I would think it has changed a lot. Uh, in, in Kabul, already uh, when uh, Hamid Karzai was uh, elected uh, president, confirmed as a president, he invited me to his inauguration. And uh, in 2004, it was, it was already uh, another city. Uh, but of course, in the provinces, especially in villages, uh, it has remained the same country and uh, very little progress has been made because the state, I mean, the state building, I mean, that has been the sort of obsession of the international community for the last uh, 20 years. But the state has not reached out to the real country, to the village to the structure of the of the country. And this is one of the reasons why the Taliban welcomed, were welcomed by the local populations of so, in so many regions, because this is a reality that we have to accept. In the Pashtun areas, they were just welcomed because they were hoping, the people were hoping that the Taliban would bring what they believe is justice, because they saw the corruption, I mean, nowadays, I mean, there was always corruption. It's a poor country, and in poor countries, corruption is unfortunately common. But uh, it has reached an extent because of the uh, enormous amounts of money that were being poured in. Uh, so, of course, uh, they would see these huge houses, these villas, you know, with the Pakistani style. Um, and and the luxury cars all around, and people starving in their villages. There was a lot of misery 
when the American left Afghanistan, there was, it was still a miserable country, and it could have been better, really. We'll have to leave it there. Much more to talk about. I want to thank you so much, uh, Jean-Yves Berthaud. I want to thank as well Patricia Aron, Mortaz Abedboudi. Thank you for being with us here. Much more on Afghanistan on our website, france24.com. <laughs>